we're going to advance the slides now to mass control systems really why what the, what's the background on some of these things and people have been talking about uh, new mass control systems why, why should you want to have one and in, in general I think that uh, you'll hear that Pneumatic error and pneumatic controls are what we call inherently modulating. And there's a couple of slides here that John will go over here in just a minute showing where this modulation is coming in. It's not just on or off control. You actually have uh, air pressure that can actually do modulation from anywhere from full off to full open and everywhere in between. But I think that we're, everybody that I talk to is, still says that pneumatic controls will continue to be long, around a long time. And when uh, you keep hearing about the pneumatic control is going obsolete. I think that's been going on since the 50s when everybody thought electric or electronic controls was going to take over the world and uh, pneumatics is still around. We still see a very, very, very large installed uh, base of pneumatic controls, hospitals, schools, uh, universities, uh, and office buildings. Uh, it's really relatively easy to change uh, when you're doing remodeling uh, to add or move a, uh, you know, a pneumatic control or pneumatic thermostat, so it's still going to be around. Uh, I think overall it's still less expensive than uh, on a variable air volume for room or space control that uh, you do a pneumatic VAV uh, as compared to doing electronic uh, digital, direct digital controls. It's still less expensive to do that, especially uh, in the last bullet point here saying where we have this existing pneumatic compressor that's one of the larger capital investments on any job and to be able to know that that's already there and if, if you have a small a change or a small add uh, to the building, then uh, hopefully the existing air compressor can be used and uh, you don't have to incur additional costs for that. So it's certainly going to be around for, for a long time. I think some of the beauty is in its simplicity. It's, it's easily understood by many who uh, dive in and, and find that they can see things happening and such. So what I'd like to talk about is about uh, something that Carla mentioned in this slide. There's the discussion of inherently modulating, and I want to expand on that. If you picture this slide with a wall-mounted thermostat, and this could be any two-position on-off thermostat, uh, I picture in my mind like a Honeywell T87F. It's just a set of contacts that would transfer on a fall in temperature. That would command the valve to open. Now, oh, there's my mouse. And when the valve opens, it would deliver full capacity heat to that zone. Now, by that I mean when you look at the original architect for a building, he's going to do a heat balance in every zone. So let's picture a corner office with a lot of glass. There's going to be convection heat. There might be some air uh, delivered through ceiling diffusers and such. But at any rate, he's going to select the appropriate amount of radiation and the operating steam pressure for design conditions, which in Wisconsin is going to be 10 below, 20 below. So on a mild day, when that thermostat calls for heat, the valve will open and deliver full design capacity heat. So the temperature will rise in the space, and even with an anticipator on the thermostat, the temperature might exceed a point of comfort by a little bit. The stat opens, valve closes, temperature falls, temperature continues to fall, and the valve reopens. And you can kind of imagine that cycle continuing on and on. So we're essentially blasting that space with a lot of heat, allowing it to cool, and uh, while in some places where there isn't a, a creature comfort issue that's acceptable, uh, in other conditions it's not. So that's typically your two position simple approach to temperature control. And if we look at the next slide, we talk about inherent modulation. Pneumatic controls are inherently modulating, so uh, we'll explore that later with the thermostats and actuators and valves. But accept it uh, for now that the valve here that's shown on this uh, hot water supply, it could be steam, it could be hot water, is going to open incrementally with changes in pressure on the diaphragm or from the branch of the thermostat. So in this case, here, oh, there it is. We saw a thermostat in a prior slide. This is the output line of the thermostat. It's called the branch. Carl had mentioned before the air supply is called the main. This is the branch. The branch pressure is delivered via polytube or copper tube down to the valve. And in most cases, heating valves are selected to be normally open, and they typically have a very low spring range. So as the pressure, as the temperature in the zone falls, 
the branch pressure falls and the valve begins to open just a little bit, admitting just a small amount of hot water through the convector or a small amount of steam through the convector. And as the temperature falls further and further from the desired set point, the valve opens more and more. So we've got the ability to add just a small amount of heat to that zone as opposed to design, uh, design condition capacity. So it, it gives you better comfort. And in the electronic world, it's relatively difficult to do this. It's not, I should say, difficult, but expensive. If we think about a two-position electric zone valve, it's very inexpensive. If we picture a small electronically controlled ball valve, it's far more. The beauty of pneumatics, first of all, in the case of the valve, is that it's very simple. It's very simple to maintain and troubleshoot, but again, it's inherently modulating. Very simple device. So again, the further from set point we are, the greater the corrective action, the greater the heat we add to that zone. Yeah, that full on, full off that you're talking about, certainly not to make, make people comfortable, is it? Right. And cost money, too, in terms of the uh, cycling and temperature. So what, here's what's going on in the marketplace. And John and I just wanted to, to chat on these things and then uh, do a little bit of a, of a review. But uh, certainly the, there's, there's trends and, you know, in the marketplace towards, uh, I would say, taking an air handling unit and making that uh, with direct digital electronic controls, but leaving, uh, leaving the zones pneumatic because the cost, again, of, the, uh, of having pneumatic zones and pneumatic thermostats out there is relatively inexpensive. But to retrofit buildings, uh, a lot of focus in on, the, on the, where the big recovery of the money would be for the initial first cost would be at the air handling units, but then leaving the zones as is. Is that you your feelings as well, John? Sure. Yeah, and the, the, one of the benefits is when you do add DDC to pneumatics, you leverage the best of both worlds because as we talked on a prior slide, the valves are very simple, very inexpensive, and the direct digital controls oftentimes offer an electro-pneumatic transducer, which will take the air supply and essentially modulate it to attain control of the valves. The other beauty of this is quite often larger systems have very, very large valves. And to get the force required to operate those valves, you have very large pneumatic actuators. They're very simple. We can develop a great amount of thrust to operate the valve stem very simply with a large diaphragm and large spring. So doing that electronically would require a very large motor, typically. So those final control devices, if they're in good shape, are left alone. And then we just attain, uh, we just uh, take over control of them with the DDC system. So we uh, leverage the simplicity on that end with the great power of today's DDC systems. And as you're talking about it, John, it also occurs to me from a repair and service standpoint, those pneumatic operators have been around, you know, for so long. And then to repair, repair one normally is just a, a rubber bladder, yep. isn't it? Yep, the diaphragm. Yep. And uh, the Johnsons and Honeywells, those parts are still available, even though the actuators themselves have been long obsolete. The springs are available, diaphragms are. Uh, it's just imperative we have the right model number to begin with, and uh, that you, of course, do it safely, because when you pull the top off, there's a big spring waiting for you. So uh, that has to be done according to manufacturer's instructions, but they are very maintainable. Yeah, the third bullet item on the slide, you know, talks about uh, explosion proof. And you get into some of the industrial areas where they can't have any of the devices, therm electric thermostats and those kinds of things, having any kind of electricity or create perhaps a potential for a spark. So you'll see and hear the word explosion proof as far as how pneumatics can be applied in an industrial marketplace and know that inherently then pneumatics are explosion proof and have a, a distinct advantage than over electric or electronic controls. Hugely less expensive. And the systems are open, which to the end user means a lot. We don't need anything special to, to program these. Obviously, there is little instruments that are needed to calibrate and service, but they're simple and readily available. Uh, thermostats from one manufacturer to another, as long as you're careful about how you select them, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of options. And ICD offers a lot of these from stock, a lot of choice. So let's uh, just do a real wrap-up summary slide here. And uh, here where we reviewed today, where we talked about the you know, major components of pneumatic control systems being the, the compressors, the uh, air dryers, and then the, the PRBs. Basically, I mean, we've reviewed some basics. And uh, understand that we're going to develop the, the other end of the system that we haven't talked about much here later in the next three sessions. So if, if some of this is a little fuzzy, that's to be expected. We're really trying to focus more on the air supply for today.